Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll hear how money from a successful lawsuit against Sheriff Joe Arpaio will be used to fund an ASU student program that covers Latino issues. And we'll talk about what's being done to engage young people who neither work nor attend school. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Back in 2007, Michael Lacey and Jim Larkin, the longtime owners of the Phoenix New Times, were arrested in the middle of the night by Maricopa County Sheriff's deputies for allegedly violating the secrecy of a grand jury. Turned out that the grand jury never actually convened, which led to Lacey and Larkin filing a lawsuit against Sheriff Joe Arpaio. That suit was settled by the county last year for $3.75 million. Today, Lacey and Larkin announced that they are donating $2 million from that settlement to ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. The money will pay for a new program in which students will cover stories about immigration and border issues. I'll talk to Michael Lacey about the Lacey Larkin Chair in Borderlands issues first. Uh, in a second, I should say, but first, the announcement was made at a press conference earlier today. Today, uh, we are taking a gigantic leap forward in that area with the announcement of the Mike Lacey, Jim Larkin Chair in Borderlands issues. Uh, this is a $2 million gift, uh, an endowed chair, uh, which means that these issues um, uh, and, this, and this, the teaching of the coverage of borderlands and immigration issues and issues surrounding the Latino community um, will continue here at ASU in perpetuity. The chair will lead a reporting program at, Con at Cronkite in which students will report and write on border and immigration issues in both Spanish and English for Cronkite News, for Arizona PBS, and for other professional news outlets, and will speak out nationally on media coverage of such issues. There's really not any a uh, school that stepped up the way Arizona State has in terms of Hispanic studies and understanding where it's at. You would think University of Texas at Austin might have a program, <clears throat> but nothing compares to ASU. And I am glad that I'm able to partner with them in this endeavor. I think it's wholly worthwhile. And here now to talk about the new endowed chair at ASU's Cronkite School is Michael Lacey, co-founder of the Phoenix New Times. Good to see you. Good to be seen. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Uh, why are you doing this? Why are you making this investment? We, we had the sum of money that we had to decide what to do with. And uh, it, it, we were given the money as a result of being arrested by the sheriff. And we were arrested for what we were writing, and we were writing for a community newspaper, so we wanted to put the money back into the community. And <clears throat> in, we have a governor in this state that, de that has decided that um, uh, Mexican-American kids should not have driver's licenses. We have an attorney general that has tried to put an end to Hispanic studies uh, in Tucson. And we have a lawman that's under a federal court injunction for racially profiling uh, Mexicans and Mexican-Americans. So we wanted to put, get the money working uh, to improve the lot of organizations that are working on behalf of migrants and Mexican-Americans. And we uh, wanted to fund the chair here at ASU so that there would be uh, reporters going out into the community to tell the stories uh, of this uh, of this segment of our population. Do you think that the coverage of immigration and border issues up to now has been lacking? Yes, I think it's been uh, lacking across the board. And in this last election cycle, uh, you, you saw a parade of television ads all aimed at attacking the Mexican-American uh, community and the Mexican community by toughening up the border, treating our, our, the, the people that live in Mexico, treating them as if they were terrorists rather than neighbors. One congressional candidate actually had uh, the ISIS flag and a black robed figure being paraded on the ad, the TV ad, as she talked about uh, needing to close the border, needing to strengthen uh, the border response. It has just been 
a remarkably hostile environment. And I, I noticed a, a quote from you was, we intend to encourage the better nature of students at the Cronkite School uh, with this. Explain that, please. Well, we, we are optimistic that there are some students uh, at ASU with good souls. Um, we haven't researched this yet, but <laughs> we believe that to be the case. And uh, we want uh, young people, as they enter this career, to have a background in the community at large, not simply on the uh, Anglo-American community here, okay, but upon uh, a very significant portion of the population. The fact that this is going to be bilingual in nature, how important is that to you? Well, I think it's, uh, it's very important. I, I went out and interviewed a couple of women uh, this last week who are part of a uh, movement here to uh, uh, get identification from the city of Phoenix, okay? Uh, these people don't have identification, okay? It makes, makes life very difficult. And the women that I interviewed didn't speak English, okay? We, we live in a bilingual world, and uh, uh, hopefully there will, there will be positions for uh, bilingual students. I know that you have the, uh, the Frontera Fund, and money goes from that to uh, certain causes and things. As far as this particular cause, when did you decide that an endowed chair would be a good idea. Well, if, if you have, uh, have a beer with Kristen Gilger uh, or uh, Dean Callahan, uh, it certainly becomes clear that <laughs> this would be a, a wise use of the funds. And uh, um, so we've, we've been working on this for uh, several months now, and we've also been in the process of interviewing and giving financial support to a dozen different um, migrant rights groups around the state or uh, Mexican-American support groups uh, here in uh, Phoenix. And that's the Frontera, uh, the Frontera Fund, correct? That's correct, yes. yes. As far as what you want to see from this particular uh, endeavor, what do you want the students to learn? What do you want to be the overriding emphasis here? I think as the students um, get to know the community uh, within which they live uh, in a more nuanced way, um, it will be, as their stories appear, it will be more difficult for uh, the government, more difficult for politicians, more difficult for demagogues to um, scapegoat the Hispanic community, which is part of what's been going on. You, you mentioned that, and yet Joe Arpaio, this is where this money is basically coming from, is from this lawsuit and from the county. Right. Uh, he enjoys, and he still enjoys popularity. He has enjoyed such support over the years, and he certainly has not been lacking for media attention. How do you explain that? Well, I mean, we're not the uh, uh, f first uh, organization to understand that the populace at large can be rabble-roused, okay? And he has appealed to the baser instincts uh, and to the paranoia about people who don't know Mexicans, uh, don't know Mexican-Americans, and don't understand uh, the uh, terrific role they have played in the history of this city and in the history of this state. Um, and, I, and the other thing that I would, I would mention is that uh, the sheriff's popularity has decreased with each election. And were we to find a candidate that had anywhere near the money that he has at his disposal, um, I don't think he would be the sheriff for another year. As far as this chair is concerned, uh, I notice it will also serve as a national voice on Latino issues. What, what exactly, again, are you looking for there? Well, there's, uh, this is, we are the state that has the border with Mexico, uh, and uh, this is a port of entry for many uh, 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 Hispanics, and I think that these stories can be told in such a way that they have a national implication and national leadership. You know, the, the, the Mexican-American community is not confined to Arizona any longer. I mean, you, I was just back on the East Coast and, you know, eating in really great re Mexican restaurants that are, and no matter what restaurant you go into, you're going to find that the staff is uh, often largely Hispanic, mm -hmm. okay? So uh, the... Uh, it's, I don't understand the sort of fear that is cultivated um, by elected officials about the Hispanic community. Do you think that fear is uh, exclusive to Arizona, or do you no. see it? No, I, I, I don't. 
I think it's exclusive to Arizona, and I think um, I think it's sold uh, as a uh, as a cheap commodity throughout the country. If you were this endowed professor at ASU and you were standing in front of a group of students, what would you tell them? What would you teach them? What would you show them? Well, the, the, there are rich political stories out there for students to be doing. There are, there are human interest stories, okay? There's, it's everything that you see in, on te the television news or that you see in a daily newspaper about the um, power structure, okay, could also be explained from a Hispanic perspective, okay, and, and should be explained from a Hispanic uh, perspective. Why is the governor trying to deny driver's licenses? You, there, is, there is no public transportation to speak of in Phoenix. Okay? If you're going to get from point A to point B, if you're going to get to your job, you need to drive a car. Do you want that kid licensed and with insurance, or do you want the kid just taking a chance? And these, these are issues that, that transcend, transcend race. Last question. There have been efforts in the past, uh, a variety of efforts, not quite this uh, uh, I don't know, large and, uh, and bold, but there have been efforts to chronicle the Mexican-American, Latino community in, in a variety of ways. What do you want, how can this be different? What do you want to see different from other attempts? Well, this, one, this will be well-financed, okay, and that's important. Um, two, um, there is a commitment. Um, the, the journalism department here at Arizona State University um, is they're not just doing this for the money. They're excited about the opportunity, uh, and they understand that. And there's a significant component of uh, Hispanic students within the journalism department. I mean, I, I, from our perspective, everything just sort of came together really well. All right. Mike, good to see you. Thanks for joining it's us. It's good to be seen again, as I said. <laughs> good to see you. <clears throat>
According to the Measures for America report, the Phoenix rate for disconnected youth has improved since 2012 when Phoenix ranked worst among the nation's largest metro areas. Here now to talk about the issue of disconnected youth, Judy Reno, College Depot Director for Phoenix Public Libraries, Rick Miller, Founder and President of Kids at Hope, and Dr. Don Covey, Maricopa County's Superintendent of Schools. Good to have you all here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Judy, let's start with defining terms disconnected youth. What are we talking about? We're talking about people who are aged between 16 and 24 and are not in school and also not currently working because they don't have the schooling needed to do so. And Phoenix is among the worst, as we heard, in, in some respects it is. The, why? What's going on out there? There's so many reasons for that, but there's now great groups and organizations that are all working together to try and make education more accessible. Is, is there a reason that Phoenix does rank so poor? Is it poverty? What's happening? I think what happens, as I, I see it, is kids enter our systems, our institutional systems, school being the first one. They enter, them, they enter those systems ready to be nurtured, ready to be inspired, and sometimes they exit that system disillusioned, discouraged, sometimes they go into incarceration. So something happens between the time they enter the system and around age 16 where the system isn't working for them. And I think part of that is that we, we start writing off kids early on because they come from poverty, they come from dysfunctional families. There's high crime rates in their areas. And from our research, we discovered that those kids are normally labeled as at risk. We have to believe that every kid can succeed without exception. Is, is there almost a preordained business going on here? If you're at risk, you're immediately at risk? <laughs> Not at all. They're very bright, very intelligent. I think it's a matter of feeding opportunities, and that's what our, our functions and goals are. And we've really replicating somewhat what they've done in Philadelphia, Boston, Los Angeles, and they've been somewhat of our tutors for the last 18 months, if you will. And there's really, we hear the doom and gloom, but there is good hope. For example, Philadelphia that established a uh, re-engagement center is how it really started. And for the last eight years, they've, they've had 85,000 young people who were disconnected to get reconnected into schools and jobs, what have you. So uh, don't want to make our valley look like it's a horrible place, even though it's a large number, uh, being number one in the nation, but in numbers, that's about 183,000 young people that cost into the billions of dollars if we don't have an alternative for them. When you're looking to reconnect these kids, these young people, what is the baseline? What are you looking to do just for starters? Well, for starters, I would say twofold. Hope, someone to believe in them, a mentor, a coach, and then also coupled with that information and access to great programs. And the good news is there are great programs in the Valley, but people need to know where to go to get connected with those items. And, and as Rick mentioned, early intervention, probably a big factor That's as well. That's huge. Mm -hmm. And is, are, are, there, are there strategies out there for that early intervention? There certainly are in the schools and also in community-based organizations, as well as in the city of Phoenix, in Phoenix Public Library, we've been trying to do so. Is there, uh, you know, we talked about the fact that, you know, some, sometimes it's almost a preordained, people think, oh, you're at risk and you're gonna be at risk. But it, the, the importance of high expectations, and, and on both sides, high ex expectations are good, but high expectations can mean disappointment for some. Not necessarily, uh, because there's high expectations in all different realms of life. So there's high expectations that you're gonna grow up and be a good mom or a good dad. There's high expectations that you're gonna be a good community person, you're gonna give back to your community. There's high expectations that you're gonna enjoy your quality of life. And then the one we tend to disproportionately focus on, there's high expectations that every kid's gonna to go to college. And maybe not every kid's gonna to go to college, but every kid can be successful. And that's where we've kind of failed our children in really defining the word success for them. What does success really look? Is it a college diploma? Or is it being a good parent, a good community member, providing for your family, and enjoying your quality of life? There has to be a larger definition of success. And if there is, more kids can succeed. Do you agree with that, Don? The idea that you, you got to give them a chance, give them hope, as you mentioned, and an opportunity, put them in a place to succeed. Absolutely. There's actually four pathways we're working on. One's re-engagement center that Judy does a great job with. Youth development is Rick's area. And then in the kind of the center fold of these two bookends, which is nice positioning of these two fine <laughs> people, is there's career pathways, but also educational momentum. And the educational system has to be altered and changed and move away from what they traditionally were not successful in. And so they have what they call big picture schools that have been very successful across America that really combines both work externships, internships, and they can actually take courses that help them 
do better in those particular jobs, but knowing what they're good at is part of the re-engagement centers that do with that. So those, those four pathways, Ted, are profoundly very successful nationally, and that's what we want to bring to the Phoenix metropolitan area. Let's say I'm a young adult, I don't have a job, I'm not in school, I, I, I think I want to get re-engaged, I don't even know what it means. I come to your center, I, I, I approach you and say, I, I want to get involved, I don't know where to start. Where do you start? Well, we have a team of smiling faces to help greet folks that are interested in getting re-engaged. We help by starting with an informational interview to get a sense of what the goals are of the individual, and then we help by providing comprehensive services. So in, additional, in addition to getting them set up with either a GED or a high school path, we also help with post-secondary education planning, and even through Phoenix Public Library, we offer a lot of career services, too, for people that do want to continue right into the workforce. And, and a lot of counseling in case the kid comes in, the young person comes in, they don't even know what they want to do. They don't even know if they want a GED. They don't, uh, that's available as well? It is, and it's one of the most important parts because it does, you know, it's that long-term vision of why continue on to get re-engaged because I can picture myself moving on into that important step of my life. And then once uh, I'm the young person and I, okay, I, got, I, think, I think I don't want to go down path A, um, how do you make sure I stay on path A? Well, there's a lot of support systems that they that Don and, and, and Judy are putting into place for these kids. And what we, we, we try to remind them is that every kid succeeds when there's three things that happen to them. One is you truly have to believe in them. They'll feel that energy. If you believe in kids, they tend to rise to your expectations. A lot of these children have dropped out because they've lacked that caring adult who didn't believe in them or a number of adults who don't believe in them. It's not the fact that kids don't have adults in their life. It's the fact that many of them say they don't have caring adults in their life. And now for the first time, they may be finding that adult that's really committed to their success. And I think that's where it starts. And then, and then beginning from that point forward, you begin to ask them, what will it take for you to achieve success? They become the agent of their own lives. Uh, they're not looking just for a handout, they're looking for a hand up to be successful. And I think what Don and, and, his, and his organization, McKees, has done, what Judy understands, is that these are evidence-based principles and practices. This isn't something that they're trying out for the first time. Other cities have tried it and it's working. Other cities have tried it and it's working. Um, we don't live in a bubble here. Why haven't we tried this more and why is it not working more here? Well, great question, Ted. I believe it's almost like Where's, uh, where's over 100,000 disconnected youth between 16 and 24? You drove to work this morning, did you see any of them? In other words, it's a huge elephant. As my friend at the United Way say, it's a wicked problem we have. And so one of the things we did back in May was increase the awareness of our community of this large number of population that caused, I mean, that cost $127 billion mm -hmm. just for this cohort between 16 and 24 with additional services, the crime that's involved with it, the addictions, et cetera. I was gonna mention something with, uh, with about Rick, is that the program he has is, one of the things we have to discover is, these young people need to increase their self-efficacy, their self-esteem, and believe in themselves again, which they've been beaten down so much of saying, I, I'm worthless, I'm addicted, I got all these problems. And that's why that we uh, engaged uh, the kids at Hope Philosophy, but all populations, if that be the case. So this is really a, a significant movement of making it happen, but we need to be aware of what it is, why it is, and then these four pathways we talked about have been very successful in Los Angeles and Philadelphia and Boston, so it'll be here. We have to change a little bit, but it works well here too. Yeah, so what, what happens to these young people is, is we, we, we may narrow it to that they are, they're disengaged, which means they're not in school or they're not at work but they're equally disengaged socially. They're equally disengaged emotionally. They're equally disengaged economically. I mean, they're, these are kids who are disconnected from so many of the parts of life that, they, that makes them whole. And so when you deal with a young person, you're only not dealing with one part of that person, you're dealing with the entire young person. And I think that's what makes this, this initiative that much different than just focusing on one aspect of young people's growth. It sounds like a difficult task though, if you've got someone that has that many fractures in their life, in their very young life, that's difficult to do. Is, is there coordination among agencies? Is there, is there a common mindset here? 
There's wonderful coordination. In fact, mckisa has been bringing our groups together through these summits, and we've been working as a team to really improve these things in our community. And like both gentlemen mentioned, doing research and making sure that we implement the best practices seen across the country right here in Phoenix so that we can tackle this and make an impact. And, and data, this data is pretty big, isn't it? I mean, it's huge to have these results right in front of you. Absolutely. There is a group called a Collective Impact Model out of Stanford University, which puts agencies, both private and public, together, and they have a common vision, a common set of goals. They don't take each other's identity away. Mm -hmm. Like these two, you're not going to take Rick's and <laughs> Judy's to look at it. They're so proud of themselves. Yeah. You know, <laughs> would you want to mess with that? So they do what they do well, but it has to be is you have a backbone organization, That's a right. convener, if you will, and enable and empower them to do good work with these young people. All right. Well, great discussion. Good luck for all of you, to all of you, and, uh, and keep that hope alive. Good to have yeah. you here. Thank Appreciate you. That. Thanks, Ted. Thank you. Wednesday on Arizona Horizon, we'll talk about the life and legacy of the late Phoenix Mayor John Driggs with another former Phoenix Mayor, Terry Goddard. It's at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. This program is part of American Graduate. Let's make it happen. A public media initiative made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.